Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to our book talk event. Uh, today, we will be talking about the book entitled The Armenians of Aintab, The Economics of Violence in an Ottoman Province, um, published in Harvard University Press in May uh, 2021. I am Umid Kurt, author of this book. And first of all, uh, I would like to thank One Near Jerusalem Institute and Polonsky Academy for making this event possible for all of us. And uh, I am and we, we are actually very honored and delighted to have Professor Omer Bartov, a pioneering and distinguishing, distinguished historian, as the discussant of my book. Uh, I would like to welcome and thank him on behalf of One New Jerusalem Institute, Institute for honoring, honoring us today. Uh, before introducing uh, Professor Bartov, uh, I would like to state how we will proceed tonight. I will be acting as a moderator as well. So I will first introduce Professor Bartow and then come up with a few introductory remarks talking about general contours of my book. And I will do my best to keep it as brief as possible. And then I will give the floor to Professor Bartow for his own remarks, comments, or take, take ons about the book. And then we will have a sort of conversation maybe. And finally, I'm planning to take a few questions from our audience as well. Last but not least, please follow uh, the events of uh, One New Jerusalem Institute via our YouTube uh, channel as well. So stay tuned with that. Uh, <clears throat> having said that, uh, let me introduce our uh, distinguished uh, host, guest, sorry. Uh, born in Israel and educated at Tel Aviv University and St. Anthony College, Oxford, Omer Bartos early research concerned the <clears throat> Nazi in indoctrination of the Verma and the crimes it committed in World War II, analyzed in his books, The Eastern Front, 1941-1945, and Hitler's Army, 1991. He then turned to the links between total war and genocide, discussed in his books, Murder in Our Midst, 1996, Mirrors of Destruction in 2000, and the Germany's War and the Holocaust in 2003. Bartow's interest in the representation also led to his study, The Jew in Cinema, in 2005, which examines the recycling of anti-Semitic stereotypes in film. His more recent work has focused on inter-ethnic relations in the borderlands of Eastern Europe. Uh, his book, Erased, Vanishing Traces of Jewish Galicia in Present-day Ukraine, in 2007, investigates the politics of memory in West Ukraine, while his most recent monograph, Anatomy of a Genocide, The Life and Death of a Town Called Buchas, Buchas, right? Am I pronouncing correctly? Buchach. Buchach in 2018, uh, which uh, has affected me scholarly quite a lot, uh, which is a micro history of ethnic coexistence and violence. The book received the National Jewish Book Award and the Yad Vashem International Book Prize for Holocaust Research among others, and has been translated into several languages. Professor Bartov has just completed a new monograph, Tales from the Borderlands, Making and Unmaking, and the Galician Past, forthcoming in 2022. His many edited volumes include Shatter Zones of Empires, Coexistence and Violence in the German, Habsburg and Russian and Ottoman Borderlands in 2013, co-edited with deceased uh, Eric White. Voices on War and Genocide, Three Accounts of the World Wars in Galician Town in 2020, another edited volume by Professor Bartow, and reflecting his new interest, Israel, Palestine, Lands and Peoples in 2021, which is quite compelling and very, very interesting, fascinating book again, uh, Professor Bartow. It's really uh, uh, exciting for me to speak uh, in front of you and talk about my book. So. I'm really thrilled to make this happen with you. Thank you so much again for honoring us and, and being with us today. So uh, <clears throat> I want to start with, uh, I mean, the very basic, what made me write this book, let's say. So I believe uh, as a historian and perhaps a na narrator, let's say, as deceased Hayden Weil always emphasized, Hayden White always emphasized, it seems that it's very difficult to separate your research problematic from your own personal history. At least there are so many instances like, like that for historians um, who are especially working on the dark annals of your own country's history. 
which has real hardships to come to, come to terms with the past. It also makes you part, uh, sometimes active, sometimes passive agent of the same historical process. You're sort of embedded to it socially, politically, and culturally. It starts with your own uprising, continues in your education, and will be with you for your whole life, almost. So my involvement in working on the history of Aintap Armenians, where I was born and raised, Aintap, the southeastern part of Turkey, 55 miles away from uh, the Aleppo border, is pretty much affected by that process. Following my graduation from Middle East Technical University in Ankara in 2007, I found myself again at my parents' house in my hometown of Gaziantep, formerly known as Antep, Aintap. One day, <clears throat> I was jabbed from my nap by a call from an old friend. Umit, where have you been? It has been ages. I know a great place in Kayacik where we can catch up. Although I was born and raised in Aintap and had, had not left the city until college, the word Kayacik did not mean anything to me. It was just another district in the city or neighborhood I had never visited and of which uh, I knew uh, uh, nothing. She said she would wait for me at Papyrus Cafe and gave me directions. I took a bus to the Kayacik neighborhood and upon arrival found myself dazed by the charming atmosphere, letting myself get lost in the side streets and leaving my poor friend waiting some more. I was on a, a narrow street with uh, beautifully uh, constructed stone houses lining each side, taking you back to a simpler, though slightly mysterious time. Tuck away between the high-rise concrete apartment buildings of so-called modernized Gaziantep, this neighborhood was like an architectural mirage for me. I felt nostalgic for a past that was never mine. Finally, I found Papyrus uh, coffee shop, which turned out to be lo uh, located in one of those exotic houses. Like most of the houses on the street, it had been converted into a coffee shop as part of the process of restoring the city. Upon entering, a few letters carved at the top of the majestic gate caught my eye. Not recognizing the script, I simply assumed these were Ottoman characters. Inside, I was once more left speechless. A spacious courtyard with staircases on either side leading up to two large rooms welcomed me. Um, the rooms were filled with antique furnish furnishings and the high ceilings were adorned with frescoes and engravings like similar to Florentine cathedrals. Feeling a surge of pride in my hometown and ancestors, I decided to talk to the owner to try to glean some information about the history of the house. He verily explained that he in inherited this place from his grandfather. It must have been especially strong coffee they were serving that day. I was emboldened to press further. And how about your grandfather? From whom did he buy this place? So the man paused hesitantly before responding. And then after a few moments, he softly murmured to the ground beneath him, there were Armenians here. I said, what Armenians? What are you talking about? Were there Armenians in Gaziantep? He nodded. I was really getting annoyed with the opacity of his answers. So I asked, what happened to them? Where did they go? He retorted indifferently. They left. As I rode the bus back home, I pondered, why the Armenians? Why anyone? would just leave and hand over such an exquisite property to someone. So I was a naive to the, po to, the po uh, to, to the point of ignorance, 23 year old university graduate, unaware of the existence of Armenians in my hometown. A few years later, I would find out that, that the house belonged to Nazar Nazaretian, honorary consulate to Iran, who was a member of Aintab's wealthiest and most prominent family. And he, his children and his grandchildren used to live in this house. Those letters above the gate were not Ottoman, but Armenian, spelling out the name of Nazar, who built the house. So this is the story about how the idea to work on this topic and write a book out of it arose. So this book is, the, uh, is, is basically the story of Aintab Armenians, who were torn away from their homes, neighborhoods, and the city where they were born and raised and flourished. This is the account of how their material and spatial wealth changed hands and was transformed. And, and this is the historical record of their persecution and subsequent erosion. So 
I would like to touch upon a few conceptual remarks before zooming in on Aintab, uh, and, and, and I think these theoretical observations or in, insights are required to have contextualized and substanti substantiated in this respect. Aintab is a good exemplary case. You know, there is this primordialist atmosphere that has been out there while talking about violence. I believe writing about violence with an awareness of uh, its embeddedness in a specific historical time and place purges it of this primitive aura that has surrounded it, an aura that has long tarnished our understanding of the Ottoman Empire and the Middle East. For instance, the rich literature on urban notables in Ottoman and Arab cities from the 18th to the middle of the 20th century has provided a comprehensive and fascinating view of the political organization of urban society from local, imperial, and national perspectives, but has offered only a, 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 a occasional glimpses of the violent social worlds of local leaders or entrepreneurs of violence and their followers. So my work in this sense tries to fill this gap. At the turn of the 19th century, many of the cities and provincial towns of the Ottoman Empire and the Cilicia region, southeastern part of Asia Minor, where Aintab was situated, have functioned amplifiers of economic and political power, social and class inequalities, and political turmoil. In the second half of the 19th century, the increasing influence of Europe and Hajar reform, Iran, together with the emergence of nationalism, created new ideological, economic, and political uh, uh, fissures in urban societies. These fault lines became manifest in the new forms of violent mobilization driven by political and ideological motives as well as economic. So, of course, global processes such as colonialism and capital penetration also produce discernible uh, patterns of violent unrest in the Middle Eastern and Ottoman cities, but less is known about the influence of local dynamics and of the differential rhythms of, of, of indigenous modernizations since the mid 19th century. The ethnic, religious and nationalist conflict that beset late Ottoman cities like in the Levant region, colonial Cairo, Algiers for instance, can be read as reflecting a counterbalancing impulse against new socioeconomic and legal divisions enforced by the penetration of European capital and imperial reform. So my book is sitting in this context, let's say. Uh, what particular topics, issues, or lit and literatures does the book address? Most studies of the Armenian genocide and more generally of violence in Anatolia, in Asia Minor, miss the local dimension and focus on grand politics and the machinations within the Committee of Union and Progress, the Ottoman ruling government at that time. My book has the potential to change the way we understand this incident and provide new insights on local agency and the role of local societies in the perpetuation of this atrocity. It brings back to the notion of class, which has experienced an eclipse in recent years in the field of genocide studies. It shows that economic and political and ideological interests of the perpetrators, the gentry, different sectors of urban population and ordinary Muslims and so forth overlapped in the process of Armenian persecution. And that intersection of, uh, intersection of these two interests determined the momentum and intensity of the violence. In this regard, the case of Aintab suggests that the Turkish Republic cannot be fully grasped without taking into consideration the concept of class. So this is a study of the Armenian genocide, but also the biography of a city in a time of trouble and violence. It discusses micro foundations and social legacies of ethnic violence. It also provides new insights on the cause and origins of genocidal policies and their impact in the making and remaking of provincial elites and by extension of modern Turkish Republic. It uh, not only looks at the local dynamics of genocide, and community reformation, but also considers the evolving, mutually informing relationship of the metropolitan power center to its regional periphery, 
thereby revealing a very significant locus of agency amongst regional elites as well. So at the core of the book is a series of studies of nationalization of state practices at the local level, the expropriation and liquidation of properties and businesses of Armenians, their forced mass deportations and their extermination. So the book focuses on the origins and implementation of these practices in the city of Aintab, and it resonates with the studies on the economic, social, political, and cultural transformation of the empire, all of which greatly influenced post-Ottoman Turkish state and society formation. Uh, I would like to point out a couple of general remarks about the book, like the gist of it, and then I will uh, give the uh, give give uh, Professor Bar I will give floor to Professor Barto. So the book digs into details of Armenian dispossession that produced the homogeneously Turkish city in which I grew up. In particular, I examined the population that gained from ethnic cleansing, records of land confiscation, and population transfer demonstrate just how much new wealth became available when the prosperous Armenians who were active in manufacturing, agriculture, production, and trade were ejected. Although the official rationale for the removal of the Armenians was that the group posed a threat of rebellion, I showed that the prospect of material gain was a key motivator of support for the Armenian genocide among the local Muslim gentry and the Turkish public. Those who benefited most, provincial elites, wealthy landowners, state officials, and merchants who accumulated our main capital, in turn, financed the nationalist movement that brought the modern Turkish Republic into being. So the economic elite of Aintab was thus reconstituted along both ethnic and political lines. Uh, the rising elite of the newly established regime in that sense gained power and legitimacy through the cleansing of the Armenian community and spoliation, its property. So they past, this, this tacit partnership in crime highlights the economic motives prevalent in almost three decades of violence faced by minorities around the turn of the century. So uh, in, a in the manuscript, I argue that the Ottoman ruling government, CUP's decision in favor of deportation and genocide had a certain level of social support, which it had achieved through the practice of effective power and control mechanisms at the local level. Therefore, the role, uh, uh, the role of local agents and provincial elite deserves closer examination. The CUP relied to a considerable extent on the cooperation of the local administration and elites, political institutions, and ordinary people in Ainta. In this sense, my work highlights how the CUP and the day local collaborators were able to mobilize local community and how this process was facilitated through the appropriation and redistribution of Armenian properties. In that sense, local actors in Aintab were not simply engaged in implementing orders or opposing them. Rather, they functioned as active and key historical actors that was present through the process. Following this conceptual framework, it can be claimed that the Armenian genocide was as much a top-down process as it was bottom-up. The relations between the central power and local authorities were not unidirectional, but multi-faceted. So genocide and plunder for sure basically were certainly centrally planned, but also facilitated by local incentives and motives. So my Finally, my assertion helps to elaborate on a central problem in the history of Armenian genocide. How did perceptions of citizenship and belonging articulated both on the state level and between neighbors change over time? And why did local relations between neighbors and within a local community end up becoming violent and destructive? So expropriation and plunder of movable and immobile properties in my case here was an essential component of the destruction process. For part of the local population in Aintab, the acquisition of Armenian property was a strong incentive to participate in the anti-Armenian measures. So uh, I am going to stop here for now. Thank you so much.
Should I take over a minute? Please, please, Professor Barto, I am looking forward to hearing you. Thank you very much. So let me first uh, thank uh, Umut Kult and the Van Leer Institute for inviting me to say a few words on this truly important, I think, path-breaking book. Uh, I'm very grateful that this invitation gave me the opportunity to read the uh, Umut study. While I'm not an expert in Ottoman, Turkish, or Armenian history, I do lecture on the Armenian genocide in a class um, on modern genocide and other crimes against humanity that I regularly teach at Brown University. In fact, my class just had lectures on this last week, uh, this time by my uh, co-teacher, uh, James Wang, a former PhD student who is co-teaching the class with me this semester. But I'm also very familiar with the methodology used so effectively in this book, namely a local history of a complex and for some still controversial event that manages to shed a new light, both on its wider historical context and on how it specifically unfolded on the ground. To my mind, this approach that combines long durée with a close focus on one location has the potential, fully realized in this book, of revising the entire historiography of the event as a whole. Now, this is precisely what I tried to do in my own book, Anatomy of a Genocide, The Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach, published in 2018, that Umit kindly mentioned. And I suspect that it is thanks to this book, another biography of a city, that Umit asked me to speak on his fantastic study. So let me begin with a personal anecdote that correlates in some ways with the story told by Umit at the beginning of his book and summarized also uh, right now at the beginning of his talk. So as he told us just now, uh, following his graduation from university in Ankara, he returned to his uh, parents' house in a town that now has a somewhat different name, uh, although it seems to me related, uh, Gaziantep, uh, as Aintab is now called. And when he was invited to meet a friend in a part of the town that he had never visited before, he was astonished by what he saw, asking himself, he writes, where am I? What is this place? And when he found the cafe where he was meeting his friend, he was, he writes, speechless because of the beauty of the house and its courtyard. And after he asked the cafe owner repeatedly, quote, from whom did you get this place? He was finally told there were Armenians here. But what happened to them, he insisted, they left. The cafe owner replied. Anyone, by the way, who knows something about German history knows this term that, um, um, speaking about the Jews, that they left. The Juden sind weg. The Jews left. It's um, it's a very common turn of phrase. Now, in 2003, I went for the first time to Eastern Galicia, uh, now known as West Ukraine, to visit my mother's hometown of Buchach and other towns in the region. Before World War II, this region was populated by Ukrainians, Poles, and Jews. The Jews were usually the plurality or majority of the population in such mid-sized towns as Buchach. But there were no signs anywhere of Jews having ever lived there and no indications of why they left. Although all these towns, including Buchach, were surrounded by mass graves where the former Jewish residents were buried. Visiting the remnants of synagogues and overgrown Jewish cemeteries where young Ukrainian boys and girls were herding goats and where chickens were pecking, I wondered, do the current residents of these towns ever ask themselves who had built these crumbling synagogues, who had lived in the houses where they now resided, who was buried in the cemeteries, and what made them all suddenly leave? This was what spurred me, just like you heard now um, by Umit, uh, to spend 20 years researching the long durée history of Buchach and then the complex history of what occurred there in World War II, the mass murder of the Jews 
and the ethnic cleansing of the Poles, both accomplished with generous help from their Ukrainian neighbors. They had lived side by side for 400 years. Now the town was purely Ukrainian and no one seemed to remember what it had once been. But in thinking about this phenomenon of social amnesia, I also began contemplating my own childhood and youth in Israel. And I mentioned this not least because I'm speaking here, although I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts right now, I'm, I'm speaking through the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem. I remembered playing as a child in North Tel Aviv and then in the recently built Ramat Aviv in the 1950s and 1960s in what had once been the Palestinian villages of Jamusin and Shahwanis. As children, we never asked what happened to the former residents of these villages. We had been driven out of them just a few years before we were born. For us, that past was tabula rasa and taboo. The zero hour of our existence began right after the great erasure, and we never thought of looking back. The Armenians in Aitab, the book, provides precisely the kind of archaeology of the forgotten, erased, and denied past that the horrors of the 20th century require. It makes what appears as natural and comforting, such as the regions and landscapes of one's childhood, appear in a different, troubling, indeed terrible light. As it excavates the past, it reveals that genocide and ethnic cleansing is not just a matter of governmental policy, but also a social event, a communal eruption, where neighbors turn against neighbors, and where the biblical saying, have you both murdered and inherited, or in another rendering, have you killed and also taken possession, become a daily mundane reality. As Umit convincingly shows, genocide is not only profitable for the genocidaire, but also a mechanism for creating a new social reality. In the case of Aintab, this means the creation of a new Turkish middle class that replaced the Armenian population deported from the town and in large part murdered, using the Armenian's property as the very basis of elevating itself materially and socially. For anyone familiar with the case of the Jews of Eastern Europe, who were blamed for hindering the creation of an indigenous middle class by occupying that socioeconomic niche, this sounds very familiar. Just as the Turks living in Armenian houses prefer not to talk about or remember their former inhabitants, so do Lithuanians and Poles, Ukrainians and Hungarians and Romanians, prefer not to remember what was at the root of the demographic and economic transformation of their countries facilitated by ethnic cleansing and genocide. Umet also reminds us that genocide, all genocides, combine a dynamic of organization and instructions from the top and active engagement and initiatives at the local level. This too has become increasingly evident in the case of the Holocaust, as local studies have shown the extent to which the Gentile populations of towns occupied by Germans participated in and profited from the killing of the Jews, not merely because they were forced to, but because that was or became part of their own agenda, namely elevating themselves into a higher socioeconomic niche now vacated by their Jewish neighbors, usually under the very windows. If we want to understand why people turn against their neighbors, Turks against Armenians, or Poles and Ukrainians against Jews, it is insufficient to invoke orders from above or even long-term prejudice. We need to remember the mighty strength of resentment, the potency of greed, and the will to improvement. This is also the deep root of subsequent forgetting and denial. But Umit also points out 
that there are deeper causes for the disintegration of inter-ethnic relations and relative communal harmony. The list he provides us with, which includes, and it's a, it's a very interesting list, uh, the reforms in the empire that eroded the traditional status differences between Muslims and others, Christians and Jews, breathing resentment and rage among the majority Muslims, the emergence of national identities grafted onto previous religious affiliations, the impact of the ongoing retraction of the Ottoman Empire, the flood of Muslim refugees, often survivors of massacres from the new Christian nations into the heartland of Turkey, the growing sense of siege and looming collapse in the Ottoman leadership and elite, and not least, the resentment against such groups as the Armenians, who appear to be the beneficiaries of this process and of European support and incursions into the empire, all of this is crucial to understanding the roots of the event that unfolded in Eintracht. It also is remarkably similar to what can be said about events in Eastern Europe and the breakup of the great multi-ethnic empires there, where stated briefly, the emancipation of the serfs created new nations and the emancipation of the Jews created a new internal and seemingly increasingly invisible enemy where ethno-nationalism was grafted onto religion and made for an ever fiercer competition over who belonged to the land and who needed to be removed from it. The closing chapters of Umit's study concern the aftermath of genocide and displacement. It is crucial to understand that the removal of a particular religious, ethnic, or national group from its homeland, even if it is extremely violent and entails mass murder, is not necessarily the end of the story. The story ends, if ever, only when this group is not allowed to return and when its property is officially and permanently expropriated by the state or taken over by the population, usually both of course. As Umit shows, between the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the emergence of the Ataturk regime, there was a window, not only for bringing the genocidaire to justice, but also for allowing the Armenian survivors of the genocide to return and to be provided with restitution, if not for their suffering, at least of their property. But international circumstances and the rise of the Kemalist nationalist regime did not allow for this. The genocide ended in this sense when the laws of expropriating Armenian property of 1915 were reinstated by the Kemalists and towns such as Aintab became purely Turkish or at least purely Muslim. This of course happened also throughout Eastern Europe where Jews returning as survivors were told in no uncertain terms that they were not welcome and that their property no longer belonged to them. Several pogroms, not least the one in the Polish town of Kielce in 1946, convinced the survivors that they had to leave. This was the final end of the Holocaust, which entailed the emptying of such post-war states as Poland of the remaining Jews with few silent and fearful exceptions. But any Israeli reading this part of the book cannot but think of the similarities between the notion of abandoned property wielded so effectively by the new Turkish regime in 1923 and the law of absentee property enacted in Israel in 1950. The combination of not allowing Armenians back to their homes and confiscating their homes as abandoned property has eerie similarities with Israel's refusal to let the Palestinian refugees of 1948 back to their villages and towns and declaring their homes and lands abandoned property because they did not return. A final word on historical responsibility. Like many countries that wish to deny the crimes of the past but at the same time assert 
the glorious past, Turkey has argued that it cannot be responsible for crimes carried out by the defunct Ottoman regime. Yet as this book shows, in 1923, Turkey reinstated the genocide laws of 1915 as a fundamental aspect of its link to and profit from that very past. There are many such cases. West Germany had a hard time accepting that the so-called crimes committed in the name of the German people, not by the German people itself, were its responsibility, even as it claimed to be the successor state of the German Reich. East Germany never took any responsibility. France had to wait for President Chirac in 1985 to accept responsibility for the crimes of the Vichy regime. And of course, in Eastern Europe, there are many such other examples. Turkey still refuses to take any responsibility and perpetuates the very argument that was at the root of the Armenian genocide, namely that the Armenians were a disloyal group that endangered the internal cohesion of the state and therefore had to be removed. In the closing chapter of the edited volume I recently published that Emma just kindly mentioned, Israel-Palestine, Lands and Peoples, Alon Confino writes about growing up in Talbia in the 1960s, unaware of, th this is a neighborhood in Jerusalem for those who don't know, uh, unaware of its past as a genteel pre-1948 Arab neighborhood, even as he admired its grand, beautiful houses. The process of unraveling the untruths and obfuscations of one's upbringing as an individual, a scholar, and a historian is the first step in confronting the past. But as a whole, it should be said, like Turkey, Israel has also never accepted responsibility for the Nakba, and continues to present the expulsion of the Palestinians as a necessary measure against a group that endangered its existence. We can only hope that the study on the scale and with the scholarly profundity of Umit Kurt's book will be written one day also on the events of 1948. So thank you very much, and I look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you so much for your uh, comprehensive and, and generous remarks, Professor Barto, about the book and also uh, the engagements and the nexuses you and the and correlations you establish, uh, links you establish with the, the Holocaust, especially the heartland of Holocaust in Eastern Europe. I think it's uh, quite insightful for, uh, for, for, for us, like scholars who are working on um, inter-ethnic strife, inter-communal strife, and, and also genocide and ethnic cleansing as mass, mass violence and collective violence events. Um, uh, actually, um, one of your, I mean, uh, one, one of, one of you, uh, the quotes you uh, use in one of your articles uh, was struck my attention, and I was quite intrigued by uh, when while writing the book. And I would like to emphasize it here because it it's really really illuminating for me uh, and for my work as well. Once you said um, you elucidate basically how the genocide against the Jews caught uh, served as as a mechanism for social mobility, for moving into better houses of killed or deported Jews, taking over businesses, giving clothes and jewelries to one's wife or mistress, or fetching toys for one's children, all facilitating by shedding of blood, unquote. So in the same way, actually, as well as eradicating the Armenian community, deportation was a means of uh, reorienting the Muslim population to a new, new uh, uh, ideological identity, social identity as well, more than enriching individual perpetrators, plunder was a way of rewarding the so-called, uh, quote-unquote, reliable, resourcing immigrants and refugees in order to properly integrate them and creating a Turkish Muslim bourgeois as a driver of national modernization, 
in a Darwinian world of struggle as well. Um, so I believe by combining sociopolitical and socioeconomic historical methods, I treat Aintab as a microcode to elucidate the confiscation and transfer of Armenian properties. It shows that this process is an essential component of a genocidal policy and, dem and demonstrate how the prospect of material info improvement serve as a major incentive for garnering the support and involvement of the Muslim gentry in the Armenian genocide. Uh, but mo more interesting, mo more interest than, interesting than that, the real fight between these elites or these ordinary Muslims who participated in this destruction process in return for reward or, and get, you know, uh, taking over all these mobile and immobile properties, the real fight started after the establishment of Turkish Republic because there were so many internal debates, fights among these people in terms of getting over the lion's share, taking over the lion's share. This, this, this fault lines during the early Republic had its reflections and repercussions in the 50s political uh, 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 political demarcation lines in Turkey, Democrat Party and Republican People's Party. The first multinational election took place in Turkey in 1950. And most of the members of Democrat Party as a challenge to Republican People's Party, Mustafa Kemal's party, these members, especially at the local scale, local level, they were mid-level genocide perpetrators who were deprived of uh, getting their fair share as a result of this destruction process. So, uh, would you like to add uh, anything to that, or I can take a few questions? I, I'll just Please. say a couple of things, and then I, I, I think we also had an interesting question. Um, you know, reading your book and, and, and thinking over, you know, what, what I also saw during my research, um, I'd say that it, one can speak about, in, in the light of this research, one can speak of uh, this kind of genocide uh, through three different prisons, and they're not exclusive of each other, they actually complement each other. Mm -hmm. One is political, ideological, uh, and that comes obviously from the top, it has then administrative and bureaucratic aspects to it. And one can never exclude that because obviously um, uh, the case of the Armenians or the case of the Jews or in several other genocides that we can talk about without a governmental um, uh, impetus to begin this process, to organize that process, to legitimize it, to actually sanction it, to do it by law, it would not look like that. You might have violence, there was violence before, you might have pogroms, massacres, but this kind of, so that's a very important element of it. And usually it comes under the guise of a particular ideology. It's not just uh, that the bureaucracy can do it, so it's not just this sort of Bauman notion of a bureaucratic genocide. There is an ideology behind it that says these people don't belong here. They have to be moved out, killed or whatever. So that's one element. And that we know. The second, which you um, very strongly stress, and I think very correctly, is the material aspect. And that's on the local scale, uh, hugely important. That's property. Uh, property, social status, that plays an enormous role in how genocide occurs on the ground and also, as you say, af afterwards. Who gets what? How is this property then partitioned, right? Um, who benefits from it? Uh, so the, the material aspect on the local level is huge. And then there's a third one, and I think you, you, you talk about it a fair amount, and I think it's, it's really important. And that's what I would call the emotional aspect. Mm -hmm. and, and the main emotion, I would say, again, is not simply prejudice or dislike of your neighbors, it's resentment. And I think that in all the cases that um, at least I can think of 
certainly the 20th century. Resentment plays a huge role. Uh, because if you think about the Armenians in Aitab or Jews in Buchach, you know, uh, these are groups that are seen as relatively more successful, yes. as those who are getting all the social goods. And the resentment that builds against them, particularly in areas that are generally not so rich, where some people are living pretty miserable lives, that kind of resentment can be very easily mobilized into violence when the state provides legitimacy and when there is material benefit. So I think these three elements, any genocide that you try to analyze, you have to bring them in. So that's sort of my, you know, uh, thinking about that right now. Absolutely, absolutely. These are very important important points. And the, actually, as a result of the, this, this, this whole uh, project and also uh, honing in the literature regarding this particular subject matter. What I glean from all these readings and works and valuable works that actually violence produces ethnic conflict, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So it's profoundly true for, especially for the Middle East, including Ottoman, of course, Ottoman Empire. It's uh, it's probably a principle maybe that could be applied elsewhere as well. Uh, as you as you have drawn out these these you know components maybe the fundamental components of uh, of of making of a pro proper full fledged genocide or ethnic cleansing let's say in a particular uh, place especially um, thank you so much for such uh, for for enriching the discussion uh, with these remarkable points I would like to take some questions if you like so the first one. Uh, to what extent is the case of Aintab unique compared to other provinces and cities during the genocide, or how is it comparable? Uh, the unique there there are there there is a unique part and also uh, similarities with with other provinces and districts uh, as well. In terms of its uniqueness, let's say uh, I don't want to put a special emphasis on the word itself, the uniqueness, but what is mutually exclusive, what is exclusive in the case of Aintab was that local actors themselves convince central authorities to deport Armenians. Because the, the deportation of Aintab Armenians uh, occurred quite late in comparison to what happened in eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire, Western Armenia, uh, known as Western Armenia. Uh, because uh, even though there were massacres during the reign of Abdul Hamid II in the city in November 1895, but the massacres of counterpart of Adana massacres did not take place in Aintab. There were relatively, comparatively speaking, harmonious relationships with, with, within the societies. Communal, communal relationships were so interwoven in the city. Just like Professor Bartow uh, beautifully analyzed in his in his book uh, about Buchach. but uh, all these the compo genocidal components again, Professor Barto has just mentioned his grief, political ideology, the, the role of religion play all pivotal roles in galvanizing and provoking uh, ordinary Muslims to claim Armenian deportation from their hometown, who were their neighbors, literally neighbors provoked by local gentry, local Muslim elites, provincial notables, who were deputies, landholders, and so on and so forth. And these people also convince central authorities located in Istanbul to uh, declare a deportation decision for Aintab. Deportations of Aintab took place in August, on August 1st, 1915, quite late in relation to other cities. Another unique aspect of the Armenian, uh, the, the, the destruction or breakdown of so, uh, social uh, uh, fabric in the city was that, uh, why was uh, deportation was so late in Ainta? Because district governor of the city and the military commander, even though they were all CUP members, local CUP members, they were reluctant to deport Armenians in the city. Eventually district governor dissatisfied by Talat Pasha, the Minister of Interior at that time, and the mastermind of Armenian deportation, 
he replaced Hilmi Bey. Uh, 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 he, he replaced district governor with a, a radical and trustworthy one for him. And military commander Hilmi Bey, Hilmi Pasha, also resigned. And the developments and the, and the deportation decision and the, and the deportation themselves as, as processes accelerated in the city after these resignations. And how is it comparable? I think uh, this is what we need in the case of Armenian genocide to make comparison between what happened in, 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 in one city and what happened in another in, in other district or town on the city. We need more regional studies in order to discern the regional variations. Uh, actually, what happened in Aintab in terms of destruction of Armenian lives, uh, pillage and uh, plunder of their properties, and also confiscation of their, their properties under the veneer of legality, just like happened in the case of Holocaust in Germany and in, and in Poland as well, uh, through, let's say, abandoned property laws or abandoned property commissions and so forth. These commissions were established in 34, 35 provinces of the Ottoman Empire in Asia Minor at that time. Uh, also, so that's why what happened to properties of Armenians in Kilis or in Adana or in Dörtyol, especially I'm talking about the southern eastern part of Asia Minor because Aintab was situated too, although it was a, it was a district of province of Aleppo, but other, dis other districts and, and also cities were in the boundaries of Aleppo too. So what uh, Aintab case is quite comparable to other provinces and districts in the southeastern part of Asia Minor as well at that time, in terms of property confiscation, in terms of active involvement of local actors and ordinary Muslims, Kurds, Turks, Arabs, Circassians, Caucasians, and so on and so forth. But of course, extent and intensification thereby eruption of violence vary from time to time, from perpetrator to perpetrator, from case to case, from episode to episode. These are really, really not uni-linear uh, kind of processes. There were variations, but also convergences, similarities, but nuances as well. Uh, second question, uh, Professor Parker, do you define the Nakba as a genocide? <laughs> uh, so um, no, I don't. Um, I, I define the Nakba as ethnic cleansing. Um, whether it was envisioned from the beginning, whether there was an intention, a, a clear plan—that's a sort of a complicated question. But functionally, uh, what happens in 1948 in two waves is an expulsion of Palestinians, uh, either through direct violence, of which there was a great deal, uh, or through intimidation, uh, so that people flee. Uh, what, what completes this process as ethnic cleansing is very similar to the case uh, that Umit that talks about. So uh, the Israeli state for many years after 1948 said, well, they fled because uh, they thought that they could come back as victors. They were told by Arab leaders that if they flee now, they could come back with the victorious Arab armies and all that. But what the Israeli state does immediately after that, it closes the borders and it says, well, you cannot come back. In fact, it doesn't do it only for Palestinians who flee outside of the country. It does it to Palestinians who flee from one village to another. And then it, it will not let them go back to their own property, even if it's just around the corner, the next village, so that they become internally displaced. So that is a process of displacement of, of a population uh, I don't define it as genocide because, unlike some, I mean, there are arguments around this, but I actually am a stickler to more clear definitions, and I think that there is a distinction mm -hmm. um, between genocide, which is the intention to destroy an entire group as such, and ethnic cleansing, which doesn't have a good definition, but has been defined by scholars, as a policy meant to remove a group from a certain territory. So it doesn't go after that group. Once it leaves the territory, the intention is to have the territory 
and remove the people. Uh, and that's certainly what uh, uh, happens in 1948, and that's quite different from a case of genocide. It is, however, true that many cases of ethnic cleansing, deportation, yes. uh, and that includes, um, to my mind, both the Holocaust and the case of the Armenian deportations is that they can become genocide. Mm -hmm. That is, that the intention initially is to move people and the result for both in the, in the um, Ottoman Armenian case and in the German Jewish case, the result is later on the deciding to entirely kill that group for a variety of reasons that we don't need to get into now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think there's a distinction, uh, but uh, in, in terms of the, the, the policies thereafter, I actually found it quite remarkable. I didn't know all the details, of course, in Umut's book before I read it, but the remarkable similarity in how do you create a situation where you say these people left their property behind and therefore it belongs to us, but if they want to come back, no, they can't do that. So we say they abandoned it. Uh, and, and that mechanism of taking over the, that, that property and thereby nationalizing it, not only in terms of becoming part of the nation, but changing its ethnic identity. It becomes Turkish or it becomes Israeli, Jewish Israeli. That's the last phase of this displacement of a population that's crucial to understand that aftermath. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Another question from Rupan Malayan, and, and I think after that we should wrap up. We are coming to end, almost on time. Uh, I was wondering if you could draw parallels of your knowledge of Armenian genocide of 1915 with recent war of Azerbaijan against Arsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Azeris have won not just territory, but also all the property and businesses which existed prior to war. Any thoughts on this? Thank you. Actually, uh, I think I can... Uh, uh, my, my answer will be in parallel with what just Professor Bartol uh, has stated and pointed out regarding uh, the definition of Nakba as a genocide or ethnic cleansing. I am more close to name it as an ethnic cleansing, but it does not, of course, close or seal the door of the, the fact that it doesn't go beyond the, the, the ethnic cleansing. So it can turn into a genocidal violence. It can gain genocidal character at any moment, at any time and, 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 and place as well and i i agree with the 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 uh, with the the fact that territory and property and businesses of uh, armenians in nagorno karabakh were pillaged uh, uh, also they were uh, driven away from their land as well expelled and 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 uh, so many uh, horrible and and uh, uh, dreadful uh, crimes also were committed by Azerbaijani militants and, and the army as well. But most importantly, cult cultural artifacts of Armenians in this place was really, really, has, has really, really been eradicated. So uh, this action can be in that way viewed as a cultural genocide in this, in, 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 in Lampian sense, let's say. Uh, yeah. That's it. Another question: uh, How the appropriate is appropriate is the use of the term internal colonization for this type of expropriation and property transfer during the genocides? Uh, I think uh, it it is quite appropriate to use internal colonization uh, for this type of expropriation and property transfer during the 1915 in Armenian case. At least I would say. Ur Umit Unger, another noteworthy uh, historian and scholar of the Armenian genocide, was the first uh, one, first scholar to use, uh, to name this as internal colonization while unfolding and revealing what happened to Armenians in Diyarbakir, another mostly Armenian populated inhabited region in Eastern Anatolia, because all these uh, processes of expropriation or the so-called legal instruments applied to confiscate Armen appropriate Armenian properties they were applied to Ottoman subjects, Ottoman citizens, not enemy alien citizens or not non-subject uh, uh, citizens of the, or people of the Ottoman Empire. They were Ottoman citizens, Armenians, Ottoman Armenians. That's why, that's the reason why 
Ottoman authorities were so smart, so clever to not use any kind of ethnic uh, denomination in the legal papers while confiscating these properties. So in terms of displacement, in terms of uh, uh, property confiscation, uh, especially in certain regions in the Eastern Anatolia, certain provinces, internal colonization, colonization were so, uh, was so palpable, was so substantial in that sense. Okay. Okay, I think we are almost done. Yes, I'm gonna wrap up. Professor Bartok, thank you so much for your huge contribution, for being with us. It was really, really great. I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled. Thank you so much for your time and for being with us. So I would like to thank all of you for being with us tonight. And, and, and please stay tuned with uh, our events at One New Jerusalem Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.